Good afternoon. We'll update the TWA crash story and join the Oprah Winfrey show in a couple of minutes. First, the very latest on the crash of Flight 800. Federal safety officials and the FBI and New York City law officials have been all over the scene in the Atlantic Ocean, some 10 miles south of East Mauritius and Long Island. There have been reports from a New York congressman that one of the plane's flight recorders had been found, but investigators so far are denying that report. TWA Flight 800 instantly brings back the image of a jumbo jet exploding in a ball of fire off Long Island on a calm July evening in 1996, only 12 minutes after leaving JFK for Paris. For many people, the name evokes headlines about terrorism, whispers of Navy missiles, and endless debates on talk radio and early internet forums about what really happened. In the weeks and months that followed, grieving families gathered at hotels near the airport, divers combed the Atlantic for wreckage, and investigators faced a level of public scrutiny that was new for aviation disasters. At the time, America was already on edge from recent bombings and airline attacks. So suspicion came easily while clear answers did not. But behind the scenes, a long and technical investigation was quietly closing in on a very different cause. Let's take a look at what caused the TWA Flight 800 crash. A summer evening over Long Island. That would be the eeriest night of my life because first, you know, you're coming out on a moonless night in the pitch black ocean. You crest the horizon and you, you see that the horizon is lit up and you think that's the lights of all the boats. But when you crest the horizon, you see it's a city of fire. And, you know, we took the boat into the fire. We had blankets and equipment. We had, we had everything. To, we thought we were going to find people that could be saved. But instead, there was mail addressed, you know, in French, um, floating on top of the water, a child's mm -hmm. toy, yeah. um, and, and people who were not, who clearly didn't survive. It was, it was very strange and, and upsetting. On July 17th, 1996, the aircraft that would fly as TWA Flight 800 arrived at JFK from Athens as TWA 881. The airplane was a Boeing 747-100 built in 1971, a familiar workhorse for TWA that had logged more than 90,000 hours in service. After parking at the gate, ground crews refueled the jet and mechanics dealt with a few lingering issues, including problems with the thrust reverser on engine number three and maintenance write-ups involving the fuel system's volumetric shutoff. It was all treated as routine, the kind of technical housekeeping that happens every day around the world. Up front, the airline had assigned a deeply experienced cockpit crew. Captain Ralph Kevorkian, in his late 50s, was in the left seat undergoing training on this route, while fellow Captain Stephen Snyder monitored from the right seat. Flight engineer Richard Campbell, another longtime TWA veteran, occupied the jump seat, overseeing the systems and coaching a younger flight engineer trainee, Oliver Crick, who sat at the engineer's panel. Behind them, a cabin crew of 15, many with decades of service, prepared the cabin for the evening transatlantic crossing. The passenger list reflected the global nature of the route. There were 230 people on board, including 212 passengers and 18 crew, with nationalities spanning 13 countries. American tourists, French travelers, Italian passengers, and others settled into their seats. 16 high school students and five chaperones from Montoursville, Pennsylvania, were excitedly headed to France with their school's French club. Notable figures included French guitarist Marcel Dadi, American composer David Hogan, and crime victims advocate Pam Lynchner with her two daughters. TWA 800 was scheduled to leave around 7 p.m., but a disabled piece of ground equipment and a baggage mismatch delayed pushback until 8.02. Once cleared, the jet left the gate, started three of its four engines, and brought engine three online during the taxi. At 8.19, the 747 took off from runway 22R and began its climb over the Atlantic. Weather was good, with scattered clouds and light winds in the fading light. At 8.30 p.m., the crew acknowledged a clearance to climb to 15,000 feet. 32 seconds later, radar returns stopped. Another pilot in the area radioed Boston Center that he had just seen an explosion ahead and watched something fall into the ocean. And the quiet summer evening off Long Island instantly turned into a mass casualty disaster. The aircraft, the people, and the recovery. Incredibly, about 95% of the wreckage was recovered from the ocean and reconstructed for investigative purposes. Now, keep in mind, a 747 is huge. You'll notice that the wings are not attached. They were not necessary for investigations. Also, this is about 93 feet long, less than half of the length of a 747. If the entire thing were here, it would probably extend almost to the tail of that plane. The Boeing 747 that broke apart over the water was one of the first jumbo jets. 
powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT9D engines. It had a center wing fuel tank containing a small amount of fuel left over from a previous flight, which had been heated by air conditioning packs during a long ground delay. This combination later proved crucial in the investigation. On board were 230 passengers from various countries, including TWA staff and families. Their diverse stories added a human element to the tragic event. When the aircraft exploded, large sections fell into the Atlantic about eight miles off East Morishi's New York. Despite rescue efforts, there were no survivors, leading authorities to shift their focus to recovery. Diving teams mapped three main debris fields labeled yellow, red, and green, corresponding to different fuselage sections. Over 10 months, divers and remotely operated vehicles recovered over 95% of the aircraft's structure. All 230 victims were identified, a notable achievement for an ocean crash. The wreckage was transported to a hangar at the former Grumman facility in Calverton, Long Island. NTSB investigators meticulously reconstructed the plane, focusing on key sections to analyze fractures and burn patterns, aiding in uncovering the cause of the accident. Dual investigations and early theories. The suspicion of terrorism was almost immediate. Many eyewitnesses described a streak of light heading towards the plane before it blew up. In the weeks, the months, and then years afterwards, the biggest and most intense investigation in aviation history at the time ensued. Eventually, the U.S. government offered their best explanation for what happened. To this day, though, many still question if they got it right. But the fact is, the information that these people had to provide was critical. When the FBI did conduct these interviews, it was done in a haphazard manner, in my opinion, and all you have to do is read the 201 files. And it's because of the system the FBI has. All, all communication is vertical. There's not a lot of horizontal communication. By that, I mean they don't share much. They ask questions, they don't answer them. And in the case of the interview protocol the FBI uses, the agent conducts the interview and then writes notes. So in effect, what he's done is writing notes about what it is he thinks you said. Witnesses along the Long Island shore reported seeing a streak of light or flare before a fireball appeared, raising immediate suspicions of terrorism. The NTSB sent a GO team to New York to investigate while the FBI and the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force opened a criminal investigation, treating the crash as a possible bombing or missile strike. The broader context heightened fears. With recent events like Pan Am Flight 103 explosion, the first World Trade Center bombing, and the Cobar Towers attack fresh in public memory. Just weeks before TWA 800, Cobar Towers had been targeted, and in July, the Olympics in Atlanta faced a bombing. This made it hard to believe for many that a passenger jet exploding over the ocean was anything but deliberate. Families of victims gathered at the Ramada Plaza Hotel near JFK, dubbed the Heartbreak Hotel, as they awaited news on identifications and the investigation's process. Many expressed frustrations at the slow confirmation of passenger lists and conflicting statements from agencies, exacerbated by intense media coverage. FBI agents conducted hundreds of interviews, collecting over 700 accounts, with about 258 describing the streak of light. Witnesses often mentioned a flare or firework followed by an explosion, while a smaller number referenced missiles. This led the FBI to initially favor the missile theory, contrasting with the NTSB's broader approach. Tensions arose as speculative details from law enforcement surfaced in the press. The government asked the CIA to determine how sound and light from the explosion reached observers. They found many witnesses likely began observing after the initial explosion, suggesting what they saw rising could have been the crippled aircraft trailing burning fuel rather than a missile. Ruling out missiles, bombs, and structural failure. But immediately there were rumors about a bomb or an errant missile striking the plane. We had a lot of FBI individuals up there, so I wasn't sure if they knew something that we didn't at that time. As physical evidence from the seafloor filled the Calverton hangar, the NTSB's sequencing group began mapping each fragment's recovery location. The debris zones were identified by color. The red zone contained parts from the front of the wing and fuselage. Yellow held forward fuselage, which remained relatively intact. And the green zone had pieces from the wings and aft fuselage. Structural experts found no signs of metal fatigue, corrosion, or a failing cargo door. The fuselage showed no significant cracks, and the cargo doors were recovered in a closed and locked position, dismissing the possibility of a blowout. This left external explosions or fuel tank blasts as possible causes. Laboratory tests found trace amounts of explosives on some fragments, which generated media attention, 
and supported bomb theories, but no blast damage was found on the surrounding wreckage. The injuries of victims did not match those scenes in previous bombings either, and most of the fuselage was recovered. The explosives residue was later attributed to past contamination from the plane's use in the Gulf War and training exercises. Radar analysis revealed no evidence of a missile targeting the jet, and military records confirmed no live fire exercises in the vicinity. With structural failure, bombs, and missiles lacking supporting evidence, investigators turned their focus to the possibility of an explosion in the center wing fuel tank, suggesting a spark from the fuel system or electrical wiring could have ignited a disaster that was never meant to occur. The spark in the center wing fuel tank. Then investigators say the final and catastrophic piece of the puzzle was what they called compromised wiring, high voltage and low voltage wires bundled together near the tank that likely caused a short. If you don't have a spark of some kind, then you don't have this event, you don't have that kind of an explosion. After the center wing tank was identified as the starting point of the breakup, investigators needed to demonstrate two critical points. First, the tank may have contained a flammable fuel-air mixture, and second, that an ignition source was realistically present. Flight data indicated only about 50 gallons of fuel in the center wing tank at takeoff, creating a vapor space above the liquid. During the delay at JFK and taxiing, heat from the air conditioning packs underneath the tank warmed the fuel, increasing vaporization and leading to the conclusion conditions were likely within the flammable range for an explosion. Tests using a retired 747 demonstrated that a propane air mixture ignited inside a tank could indeed cause structural failure. Investigators then examined the fuel quantity indication system, which uses wiring and probes to measure fuel levels. They found electrical arcing in the FQIS wiring, which resembled issues seen in a previous fuel tank fire. And the cockpit voice recorder provided additional insights, capturing comments about abnormal fuel flow readings and electrical noise consistent with an interruption in power. The fuel quantity gauge showed discrepancies that indicated potential electrical issues just before the explosion. In August 2000, the NTSB concluded the probable cause of the accident was an explosion in the center wing fuel tank likely triggered by excessive voltage from a short circuit within the FQIS wiring. Now it's time to hear from you. What are your memories of the TWA Flight 800 crash? Let us know in the comments section below.